Last week, we started a brand new teaching series, and it was called, yes, it was called The Bible for Grownups. And uh, we got started uh, by asking the question, you know, where does the Bible come from? And it's an important question to ask because when we're little, when we're children, we probably don't care where the Bible came from. We're more interested in the stories that are in the Bible. But as we get older, then all of a sudden, we, we need more than just the stories in the Bible. We also need to know the story of the Bible, as in, where did the Bible come from? That's really, really important. So that's what we talked about last week. If you, by chance, happen to miss last week's service or last week's message, you can always catch up. You can visit our YouTube channel or visit our website. We even have discussion questions to go along with each and every uh, sermon that we cover. But today, what we're going to do is we are going to put the clutch, clutch down, and we are going to switch gears Cars don't have clutches. Some of the kids are like, what's a clutch? We're going to switch gears, and today we are going to talk about a different question. And that question is going to be, what is the Bible? What is the Bible? Now, that's a really interesting question, and I would actually like you to think that through yourself for about 20 seconds. I want to invite you to turn to somebody beside you, and for 20 seconds, just ask each other this question. If someone asked you, what is the Bible? And it doesn't matter if you like the Bible, or you don't like the Bible, if you read the Bible, if you haven't read the Bible, that doesn't matter. What's a good definition of the Bible? What is the Bible? Ready? Three, two, one, go. <sighs> I want to say, if I could just bring you back now, if I could just get you, get you to come back, I have heard over, over my time lots of different answers for what is the Bible. I've heard this one, that the Bible is a guidebook for life. It shows you how to live your life, takes you where you want to go. Just read it, and it'll point you in the right direction. That's, that's good. I've heard that the Bible is an encyclopedia of truth in that whatever you need to know, do you need to know something about money, you need to know something about love, need to know something about sex or whatever, just flip to the right page in the Bible and you'll find it, it's there and it, you know, you can just find it like, a, like an encyclopedia. I've heard other people say the Bible is a love letter. Uh, Billy Graham used to say the Bible is God's love letter to humankind. Maybe that's how you uh, define what the Bible is. Other people say, no, the Bible is actually an allegory. And what I mean by that is you don't just read the words of the Bible. You have to read for the hidden symbols and the deeper meaning underneath the words of the Bible. So the Bible is this allegory. Or some people, and maybe this was a teacher at high school taught you this, or you went to university and a teacher said that the Bible is, is just ancient literature akin to other stuff that was written by Plato or Aristotle or Homer or something like that. Or perhaps you've even had someone tell you that the, the Bible is actually really valuable as an artifact. It, it just tells us about what was happening during a certain period of time. And especially if you want to know what a bunch of ancient Hebrew men thought about God, then yeah, it's a good, it's a good idea to study the Bible. Now, there's a lot of other answers to the question, what is the Bible? You probably just shared a bunch of different answers to what is the Bible. But it is really, really important that we get this question right. And here is why. Because if we don't know what the Bible is, then we will turn it in to something that it isn't. And when we start to use the Bible for something that it isn't, then all of a sudden we can abuse it, we can misuse it, to our own ends and to our own advantage. I'm going to give you a little example, but when we were kids, we came across this recipe for how to make your own dog treats. And uh, it said, you know, you have to mix bacon fat with like peanut butter and gravy, put some old gravy and flour in there and a bit of dog food from a can and you mix it all up and you baked it in the oven and then you brought it out. So we made these dog treats. We had a dog. And then my grandpa, who lived with us, was out doing chores, and uh, he, he walked into the house while these, while these dog treats were cooling on the counter, and he picked one up, and he, he just took a bite of it. And we're like, Grandpa, don't eat it. It's dog food. But it was too late. He had already eaten it, and he was already, already spitting it out. Here's, here's what happened. He thought it was one thing, but it was something completely different, and the same is true of the Bible. If we open the Bible and start reading it, thinking that it is one thing, then ooh, it might leave a very bad taste in our mouth. So what is the Bible? What is the Bible? Well, the best definition I've come across for the Bible is actually from an organization called The Bible Project. If you go to thebibleproject.com, they've got all sorts of videos and resources to help people engage with 
the Bible, I strongly encourage you visit that sometime during this series. All the resources are completely free. But at the Bible Project, they have come up with this definition of the Bible. I don't think you can beat it. The, the Bible is a library of writings that are both divine and human that together tell a unified story which leads us to Jesus. Why don't we just say that one together? Because this is a really important definition. Let's say it. The Bible is a library of writings that are both divine and human that together tell a unified story which leads us to Jesus. I put that definition in four parts because I want to look at those four pieces this morning as we try to figure out what the Bible is. Let's start with this. The Bible is a library. You might say, no, 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 the Bible's not a library, the Bible's a book. The Bible's not a book. The Bible is not a book. Now, the word Bible actually comes from the Latin word Biblia, which means book. But actually, inside the Bible, the Bible never refers to itself as a book, which begs the question, is the word Bible unbiblical? Boom, boom, boom. Ah, what does that mean? <coughs> now, uh, it's not... Um, uh, it's no wonder, though, that we think the Bible is a book, because look, uh, Gutenberg invented a printing press, and he jammed all these things together, and now we carry this thing around, and yes, it looks like a what? It looks like a book, right? But actually, it's not a book. It's a library of writings. Now, to help us understand this, I thought I'd let you know that this week, our staff decided to take a trip down to the local library, Streetsville Library. We didn't have any work to do. We only really work on Sundays. So we were just <laughs> saying, let's go down, let's do some, some reading. And so we went down to the library, and it was very interesting to see how the different staff gravitated toward different genre of reading. So Natalie, <clears throat> you may not know this about Natalie, she's a major mathematician, and so she was ready to read a math book, some kind of math textbook. Uh, then Grace felt like digging into a little bit of history, so she found a book about World War I, and she was, she was reading that, a history book. And then uh, Sally, Sally's a, always a Oh, one for a good biography, so she found this biography on Michelle Obama. And then Elizabeth, was, I guess she was hungry maybe or something, but <laughs> she came across a cookbook and started reading through it. And then uh, I was, you know, wondering what was going on in the news, so I grabbed a copy of the newspaper. And then uh, Liz, our um, stewardship director, she was feeling poetic. She grabbed a copy of, of Shakespeare's poetry. Uh, true to form, Libby found a legal... <laughs> a legal book uh, about the criminal code, and she was going through some of the finer points of the criminal code, so it was a legal textbook. And then we couldn't even find Alex. Uh, he had gone downstairs to the children's section <laughs> where he found a copy of the Chronicles of Narnia, and that's where he was, was reading. But the point is, the point is, you come to a library very different than you come to a book. When you come to a book, it's usually all one genre, right? This is a novel, or this is a memoir, or this is a cookbook, or it's a textbook, or something like that. But the li a library, a library has it all. And you have to read each type of literature different according to the genre that it is. You don't read, I mean, Elizabeth wasn't reading the cookbook the same way that Libby was reading the legal book, and, and Alex wasn't reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe the same way that Sally was reading the biography of Michelle Obama, right? The Bible's filled with different types of literature, different types of writing. There is biography, there is legal writing, there is history, there is poetry, there is prophecy, there is census data. There are genealogical records. There are letters that you, you can't read it all the same way. And so many problems emerge when we try to read the Bible as if it were all the same genre, but it's not. It's written by different people, different contexts, even different languages, and we have to understand all that. I found um, this uh, author who had written a book. The book was called Don't Read the Bible Literally, but literarily, meaning we need to read the Bible according to its genre, right? According to what the author was actually trying to get across in that particular part of the Bible. Now, some people here might say, Rob, I take issue with that. I always read the Bible literally. I'm a Bible literalist. And I would actually say, I don't think any of us truly are, biblically speaking, literalists. For example, here's a few test cases. This is from Isaiah 55:12, where we read, the mountains and hills will burst into song before you. 
and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Now, is this to be taken literally? Literally, are the mountains going to form mouths and start singing? Are the trees literally going to grow hands like Lord of the Rings style and start clapping their hands? I think all of us would say, no, this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor saying that when God becomes king of all the world, then even all creation is going to, in a way, celebrate that moment, right? We don't read that literally. I, you don't read that that way. Now, here's another test case. I'm going to throw another one at you. <clears throat> this is from 1 Thessalonians 4:17. There, Paul writes, after that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet them in meet the Lord in the air. Okay. Some of you might be familiar with this passage, but the idea is that when Jesus returns, what's going to happen is all of the true believers, you know, according to one interpretation, we are going to be swept up into the sky because Jesus is going to come from the heavens, from the sky, and we are going to meet Jesus in the sky, and then we are going to turn around with Jesus, and we are going to head back to heaven where we'll live with him forever, and everybody else gets left behind, right? You're familiar with the left behind books. They're in the library somewhere. I'm not sure under what section they would be. Maybe they're for sale in the front where they give away the books, but, but that's what happens. That's what one interpretation. But actually, if you read this, historically speaking, understanding where Paul was and what he was talking about, then many scholars today say, no, no, no. What he's doing is he's alluding to how sometimes when a dignitary would come to a town, uh, what would happen is the citizens of that town would say, hey, the king is here, and they would run out and line the streets and welcome the king as he arrives, and then not go off to some other place with the king. No, come back to the town, come back to the city with the king to celebrate his presence. So you see, that's a very different interpretation, right? And so you, you can't, I don't think in this case, just read this literally. You have to know the context. You have to know the history of what's going on there. Okay? Now, here, here's another one. Um, Genesis 1 to 11. Most scholars agree that when you read Genesis 1 to 11, there's, it's a different kind of writing there than when you start picking it up in Genesis 12 and on. So in Genesis 1 to 11, we have the, the days, six days of creation. We have Adam and Eve. We have the serpent in the garden. We have the flood. We have the Tower of Babel and, and so on. And then in, verse, in chapter 12, we start to hear about this guy named Abraham who was called by God and God led him on a journey and, and all the, 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 the purpose of his life and his family and it goes on from there. So when you come to Genesis 1 to 11, what is the question that you need to ask? Is the first question to ask, well, was there literally six 24-hour days that God created the earth? Was the flood a global flood or a local flood? Uh, you know, was it really just Adam and Eve? Were, are those the, is the world really just 10,000 years old? Are those the questions we should start when we come to Genesis 1 to 11? I would say no. The first question to ask is rather, what kind of literature am I reading here? And it's really important because something that you're reading can be really, really true and yet not literally true. You saw a picture of Alex downstairs in the library. He was reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe literally true? No, it is not. There's no such thing as centaurs or fawns or naiads or talking lions. Yet, ask anyone who's read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and they will say that in those pages, there is deep, deep truth. Many scholars are actually aren't even sure quite how to read Genesis 1 to 11. What is it we're reading here? Is it history? Is it myth? Is it allegory? Is it a parable? Poetry? What, what is it? My point is, even if it's not literal truth, it still tells us something that is really true, like who we are and who God is and what God is like and what, and what the world was created for. And all the, Those are the types of questions we first need to be asking whenever we come to the Bible because remember, the Bible is not a book. It is a library full of different genres, different types of literature that are all deeply true even when they're not literally true. Okay, that's the first point. The Bible, the Bible is a library. 
Let's go on to the second part of that definition. Secondly, the Bible is both divine and human. Okay? Uh, what does that mean? Well, let's start with the divine part. By divine, we mean that behind every word and phrase and paragraph in the Bible, uh, God is there. God is behind it, right? The Bible is inspired, the scriptures say. Not inspired like a Tony Robbins motivational pep talk to get you inspired, but inspired as if to say that, well, like, like that these were God's words to us. Uh, Peter, Peter writes this. He says, for prophecy, and maybe just substitute in there uh, the Bible or scripture, uh, scripture never had its origins in human will, but prophets, and you might substitute in their Bible writers, the authors, that, but the authors, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Or as one of my favorite scholars, N.T. Wright, said, he said, inspiration is a shorthand way of talking about the belief that by his spirit, God guided the very different writers and editors so that the books they produced were, and get this, they were the books that God intended his people to have. Tomorrow morning, if you get up, when you get up to read your Bible, you are reading the books God intended you to have. You are reading the words God intended you to have. In that way, it is very truly God's Word. And yet, it's also King David's Word, and it's Jeremiah's Word, and it's Peter's Word, and it's Paul's Word, right? Because it's divine and human. There, there's a, a famous painting, actually it was destroyed during World War II, um, uh, by Caravaggio called St. Matthew and the Angel. And in the painting, it shows an angel whispering in St. Matthew's ear as if to dictate to St. Matthew uh, what, what he should be writing down as he wrote the Bible. Now, it's actually interesting because some religions, I believe, uh, think that their holy books uh, came to them that way. I think Islam would say that this is kind of how it happened. And I also think uh, Mormonism uh, Mormons believe the Book of Mormon was like verbally dictated, um, but it's really, really important to know that the Bible and Christians have never said this uh, about the Bible. Instead, instead, Christians believe that God is always working through free, flawed, intelligent human beings. And as they wrote, God was not working them like a puppet, and God was not whispering in their ear. As they wrote, God said, I'm not going to erase your personality. I'm not going to take away your culture. I'm not going to erase your vocabulary or your worldview or whatever. Instead, God collaborated with human beings to create the scriptures. And so, Paul writes very differently than Ezekiel would write. Ezekiel would write in a wild and flammable, and, and Mark writes very differently. Mark is very efficient and short and to the point and so on. So you see, when God inspired the writers of the Bible, he gave them tons and tons of latitude and freedom to be human. And that humanness comes through the scriptures, which means we don't need to hide the fact that there are human fingerprints all over the Bible. Rather, that is something that we should celebrate. And you see this everywhere you look in the Bible if you read properly. For example, take this one for example. This is all taken from 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. He begins the letter by saying, Paul, to the people of Corinth. So who is writing this? He's saying, it's me, it's Paul. Uh, Paul's writing, I'm Paul, I'm the one writing this. And then in verse 7, or chapter 7, he says, I give this command Oh, but then he corrects himself. Oh, it's actually not I who gives this command. It's the Lord who's giving this command. So we're like, okay, so what Paul is saying right now is actually not coming from Paul. This is actually Paul giving us what, what God is saying. And then two verses later, he says, and to the rest of you, I say this. But then he says, no, this time it's me. This time it's me talking and it's not the Lord. So you see, this, Paul's not even trying to hide this tension, that the Bible is this mix of human and divine sources. And obviously, the best way to understand this tension is probably to look to Jesus himself. Jesus is both fully God and he's fully human. He's not just God pretending to be human, and he's not human 
with a little bit of a divine spark in him. No, Christians have always understood that he is he's not either or. He is fully God and fully human. And the same way the Bible is both divine and human at the same time. It is on the one hand from the Spirit of God breathed out by God. And on the other hand, it's Paul and it's Mark and it's Jeremiah and Isaiah and so on. So there you have it. So, so far we've got this. The Bible is one, a library. Two, the Bible is both human and divine. Now, let's talk about the third point of that great definition we received. The third point is the Bible tells a unified story. Unified story. Now, I'm not going to say too much about this, but I will just point out this uh, this little pie chart that I found. Um, It shows all the major types of literature found in the Bible. And as you can see, 60% of the Bible is history or narrative. So yeah, there's poetry there, and there's wisdom literature, and apocalyptic literature, and prophecy, and and letters, and so on. But most of the Bible is a story. And even more than this, you have to understand that the Bible is telling an overarching story. This great narrative arc moves through the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Walter Brueggemann, he said this, he said, the Bible is a complex tapestry of voices and genres, and yet, this is a really important yet, through it all runs a unified narrative, the story of God's relentless pursuit of relationship with humanity. That sounds like God's love letter there, the way he's writing it. It's important that we learn to read the Bible as a story. Human beings love stories. Stories, uh, you know, get our attention and they evoke our imagination. Like we, we're, we're, met, we're made for stories, right? And the Bible tells the greatest story ever. Another guy I came across this week, John Mark Comer, uh, said there's another really good reason why you should read the Bible as a story. And that's because if you read the Bible as a story, it helps deal with some of the apparent contradictions that you might find in the Bible. Here's what I mean. Let's say you're reading the Bible and you turn back to the book of Leviticus and you see here in Leviticus, there's a whole bunch of laws that say you shouldn't eat this food, you shouldn't eat this food, and you shouldn't wear these clothes, and you shouldn't wear these clothes. You might say, oh, interesting. It says here that we shouldn't eat these food and we shouldn't, we shouldn't wear these clothes. But over here, and then he you know, turns to the New Testament and says, but over here it says that we can eat uh, any food we want and we can wear any clothes that we want and so on. See, so, huh, do you see the contradiction? The Bible says this over here. It says this over here. And if you read the Bible as if it's an encyclopedia, you're going to run into all those contradictions over and over and over again. But the way you have to understand this is it's a story. And there were, here in the early part of the story, there were these food laws that were really important for that part of the story. At that point in the story, God's people needed to remain distinct and they needed to to remain separate so that their identity as God's people could be formed and not influenced by the cultures around them. That was that part of the story. But now we're in a different part of the story. The part of the story says we're supposed to go out and we're supposed to take the good news of Jesus to the world around us and not remain all kind of separate and isolated. We're in this part of the story. And here in Mississauga 2024, we're definitely not in that part of the story. We're in another Another part of the story yet. We are so if we read the Bible as a bunch of like disconnected little pieces, you're always gonna run into say this doesn't match that and that doesn't match that. But if you read the Bible as a story, it's gonna help you see how God is working through history and actually how God is still working today, and Jesus is still working today. That brings us to the fourth point. That brings us to the very fourth point here. Uh, Let me back up one slide there. The Bible leads us to Jesus. It's a library, human divine, tells a story, but that story leads us to Jesus. That does not mean when you open your Bible on every page, you are going to see Jesus' name on every page. But what it does mean is that in every page, in every chapter, in every paragraph, there is something pointing us forward to Jesus. Here's a fun fact. You have probably heard many people call the Bible the Word of God. But you know, the Bible 
rarely refers to itself as the word of God. Instead, do you know what the Bible's talking about when it refers to the word of God? Yeah, that's right, Jesus. For example, when John begins his gospel and he says, in the beginning was the word, he doesn't mean in the beginning was the Bible. He means in the beginning was Jesus. That's what the word means. In other places in the Bible, when you see the word of God, it's not just referring to Jesus, but it's referring to the gospel of Jesus, to the story of Jesus, to the good news of Jesus. So, for example, when Paul writes this to Timothy, hey, Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season. Is he saying, Timothy, preach the Bible in season and out of season? Actually, in context, no. Nothing wrong with preaching the Bible, but what Paul is saying here is preach the good news of Jesus, whether it's favorable or unfavorable circumstance for you, right? Or... Or how about this one? This is one of the most popular ones that people use to talk about the Bible, the Word of God, right? Hebrews 4, we read that the Word of God is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. Is this talking about the Bible? Is the Bible alive? The Bible's amazing, but it's not alive. The Bible has words about life, but it's not alive. Only Jesus, the true Word of God, is alive. Jesus is the Word. The message of Jesus is the Word. And it's important to get this straight because it can happen that some people elevate the Bible so high that they actually worship the Bible more than they would worship Jesus. And we want people to get excited about the Bible. That's what this whole series is about. But don't let it warp into bibliolatry, right? We don't worship the Bible. We worship Jesus Christ, and He's the one to whom the whole Bible is pointing. We heard this read for us this morning. Um, Jesus said to a bunch of Pharisees, He said, you guys are studying the Scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life, but these are the very Scriptures that testify about me. Jesus is talking to religious leaders, people who knew their Bible better than you know your Bible and better than I know my Bible. He's speaking to people with a very high view of the Bible. But you see, he's saying, you don't understand the plot of the Bible. You don't understand what the Bible is pointing to. And, and maybe you've, got, here's the thing, maybe you've come across people who, who know their Bible. Man, oh man, do they know their Bible. But they do not seem like kind people. They seem cruel and cold, and they seem kind of angry all the time. And do you know why that happens? It happens because you can know your Bible and not know Jesus. You can study it and read it and memorize it and still not be anything like Jesus In fact, that's one of the worst things that could happen is to become this snooty, mean, cold, unfeeling, but highly educated student of the Bible, right? But then then our lives look nothing like Jesus. So what I'm saying is it's not enough to know the Bible. It's not enough to believe the Bible. It's not even enough to say the Bible is sacred and highly revered or holy or inspired. The Bible's amazing, but it cannot give you life. Only Jesus, to whom the Bible points, can give you life. So, so what is the Bible? It's a library. Secondly, the Bible is both human and divine. The Bible tells a unified story, and most importantly, the Bible leads us to Jesus. So if you take last week, now we know where the Bible came from. If you take this week, now we know what the Bible is, And once we've gotten that far, then finally we'll be able to see what it is that the Bible does. What is the Bible for? But that is going to be our topic for next week, and we're going to pick it up there.